Okay, we're live. Mary has a habit of dropping the audio in the beginning. Look, I haven't been doing it for the last few episodes. <laughs> I kept missing a step in setting up the stream, because live streaming, there are all these steps to it. So I kept missing a step that was catching the audio from the person on the other side. And then we kept hearing from people watching the live stream that they just hear us and not the guest. And the guest is like talking and we're like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> so we need some audio from you so we can hear if we have it. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, and so we're working through audio right now and make sure that we don't get that uh, same effect here. Huh. It's playing through here. It's capturing here. So that's not good. I don't know what the problem is. Hmm. All right, try to say something now. How about now, Catherine? <laughs> still no. I, I, we can still hear you, but it's not making yeah. it to the screen. Yeah. yeah. Give me one second. So let's try see. Another so, thing. so how many languages do you speak, Catherine? Well, I, I do with English. <laughs> me too, me too. But um, I still speak Japanese, okay? Like, I can, if, if you put me on a street in Japan, I can navigate no problem. But reading now, I used to be able to read um, at, like, a middle school level. But now yeah, I can go. only read um, at, like, an elementary school level, which is not great. <laughs> You're getting there. <laughs> Okay. okay, we got it. I just, we're all good to go. I don't know what was awesome. wrong, but I just removed it and re-added it, and now it seems to be working. So we're good. That's, so, that's what we got to do sometimes. Uh huh. <laughs> you all ready to go? Yeah. All right. All right. Welcome to The Critical Path with Mary and Jason, a podcast about business development, company culture, and loving the place you work a little bit more. This is episode 73, and we're here today with Catherine Larson, the seaweed girl. We're really excited to get the chance to, to talk with you and, and share your story. Uh, I've been following you on, on LinkedIn and social media, and it's super compelling, uh, especially for someone so young. You've been doing a lot. Mm -hmm. So great to have you here. We really appreciate you making the time for it. So Catherine, uh, go ahead and, and share a little bit about who you are and, and where you came from. And I, I will lead with the, the fact that you tricked me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because the first interaction that I had uh, trying to, to track you down and figure if we could get you on the show uh, is that I watched a video and you were speaking Dutch. Is that I was right? speaking Danish. Danish, yeah. I, I, yes. And, and oh. uh, I fully believed that, that you were not an American native. He said, I, I want to have her on the podcast, but I just hope that, you know, her, that she's comfortable enough with English to be yeah. able to do it. <laughs> oh my God. That's so funny to me. I'm, I was born and raised in New Jersey. So I'm <laughs> I, like, I spent the first 18 years of my life in Jersey. So I'm a Jersey girl through and through. And always, you, said, always and you, said, you said that you're not <laughs> snooky. I'm not snooky. No. So that's very important for me to, to share with the world. Um, <laughs> You know, not that there's anything wrong with Snooky, but you know, it's just not that kind of Jersey girl. You're just different people. <laughs> yes, exactly. I know. I know we have the same hair color, but you know. <laughs> that's, that's where it ends. So, uh, Catherine, go ahead and tell us a little bit about uh, your beginnings. So, you came from Jersey, and then you traveled the world. Yeah, that's, Jersey is like my origin story. <laughs> but um, so when I was younger, I was always really interested in Japan and Japanese mm -hmm. culture. Um, and uh, I had the awesome opportunity when I was younger to be able to study at language school um, 
at, at uh, Drexel University in my summers. So I was really nerdy about this. Um, and I was always torn between different tracks. Like, hey, what do I do? I'm interested in languages, but I'm also really interested in architecture. I really want to go to architecture school. Um, so I kind of busted my butt in high school and I got into Cornell University's architecture program, which is one of the best undergraduate programs in the States. But then I was so burnt out <laughs> that I quit to my parents and I said, can I please have a gap year? <laughs> <laughs> so I took this nice, like long year off break. Uh, I went to Japan um, and I studied Japanese language for a full year at a language school. And I ended up meeting a boy there who was Danish. And I went back to the States. I started school. It turned out school was very, very expensive in the States. Yeah. So then I went to my parents again. I said, school's cheaper in Denmark. Can I, <laughs> can I move to Denmark? Um, and at first they were like, no, like you worked so hard. Like this is your dream. Um, and it was, but I think having the freedom to study abroad was just such a wonderful eye-opening experience that I was, I wanted to try it again. Mm -hmm. And so I packed my bags. I transferred after a year to the school of uh, the Copenhagen School of Design and Technology mm -hmm. in Copenhagen. And um, I started studying architectural technology. Um, and that was pretty funny because my impression first off was that I was going to be, you know, I was going to have a path to become an architect. I was going to work in an architecture office. And I come to Denmark and I realized that there's actually two separate professions. Mm -hmm. There's the architect and there's the business constructor. And the business constructor wait, 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 is... Wait, 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 what is that? That's an architectural technologist. Oh, but it, okay. what it really means is a building constructor oh, you know, in it. English. And, and that's a very highly technical construction management focused education. So suddenly I had gone from a school where you, everything is architecture, we design, design with a peacock, oh, craziness, to like, this is construction, concrete. We have timber frame, prefab, you gotta build this. How are you gonna build this project? So um, it became a really nice mix of skills for me to go from this highly conceptual stuff to this very physical stuff. Well, in my experience, I've, I've run into really two different ty types of architects. So you have the, the architect that is the interior designer version. It doesn't yeah. mean that they can't build things, but where their passion is, is making things pretty. It's creating the gingerbread. It's, the, it's having a vision. It's, it's kind of this, this very art-driven form. It's creating a piece of art. Whereas yeah. on the other side of that, there is the technologist, there's the technician, there's the scientist, the engineer. Mm -hmm. That person knows how to build things and knows how to, how to make them connect and how, how to make them work. And if you're working on a project, and I guarantee you, you've worked on projects before for folks who are listening, uh, where you're missing that technologist and your ar architect, you are in a bad, bad place. Because oh, if yes. we're only, only building pretty with no engineering or, or technician aboard, we're going to have a, a tough time. And I think that it's it's really interesting that you went into architecture kind of with the, the art in mind, but then this whole world opened up to you like, wait a minute, yeah. you actually have to know how to build this stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I would say too that that became the, the beginning more of my obsession with materials. Um, and, and one of the first things that really shocked me was seeing how much styrofoam we use in the building industry. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I had grown up, styrofoam was bad. Styrofoam cups, oh no, they're going to take so long to decompose. And yet, you know, it's this really essential building component. So I began looking more closely, okay, how are buildings put together? What about the materials that we're using? Um, and I was always very interested in traditional architecture. So I began looking at Danish traditional architecture and going around with my camera, my sketchbook um, and seeing, okay, how did people used to build in Europe like a thousand years ago? How did the peasants build their little farmhouses? What were they using? What were they doing? And, and a key there is that when you tour Europe and we have it, mm -hmm. but, but rumor has it that when you tour Europe and we've seen photos that a lot of the buildings are still there for hundreds yeah. of years. And and they're in still good condition. Of course, you have maintenance and what have you, but we don't really have the history of, of those types of buildings here. And I think if you, you look at the, the era of building in the 50s and the 70s, where we have kind of the, the cheapest build that we could do, they were all built yes. like mobile homes. And yeah. you know, 30 years later, it's tough to, to actually renovate them because they've, they've been built so poorly. Yeah, actually, that that was something that um, I really noticed. Uh, I, I noticed that 
uh, building for longevity and for quality is so deeply prioritized and there's still a deep focus on uh, craftsmen and craftsmen educations. Um, so for example, my school didn't just accept nerdy students like that wanted to like study technology. They also accepted students that had a background as a bricklayer for two years. So if you had terrible grades in high school, but you were a bricklayer, you can use that experience to then apply. So I was with people who were uh, carpenters. I was with people who were bricklayers, who had all this experience and knowledge. And I was running to them and saying, how do I look at a window detail? Which part is which? <laughs> you know, how do I connect the brick to the window? <laughs> and so it's it a fantastic experience to be able to, um, to have this just pool of knowledge um, in, in one place and then build upon it. And un unfortunately, I would say about the education was that they were, um, they said, because we were technologists, we should not ever, we were not designers, so we should never design. And I just couldn't agree with that. <laughs> so I was always trying to find little ways that I could sneak in and, you know, bring in some conceptual stuff um, and build on that. Yeah. Got it. So uh, what were some of the differences in, in the educational system? So you said that, that it's cheaper less expensive. Uh, this is what you told your parents, at least. That, <laughs> no, it's, that... no, it's very true. It's very true. So so one year of schooling at Cornell was um, including room and board and all of that was about $68,000 mm -hmm. back in 2013. Mm -hmm. To study at uh, this school in Europe, it was about 7,000 euros per semester or per semester. So about 14,000 euros a year. Yeah. And right now I'm studying at TU Delft and I'm studying as a non-European student and that's 18,000 euros. Mm -hmm. But I need to stress Danish citizens and European citizens can study completely free in Denmark. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, they pay 2,500 mm -hmm. euros mm -hmm. a year. So it's just if you come from outside the European Union that you have to pay higher tuition costs. Mm -hmm. But for the people who are living here locally, they pay next to nothing. Yeah. So well, and I excellent. and I think this this is a topic for a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But we're strong believers in education. Uh, we we provide training and education for for field leadership and for construction workers who who missed out. We're running our, our yeah. basic training program right now for people who uh, don't get those opportunities. Um, and again topic for a, for a different discussion, but I think that in the U.S. we've largely moved away from prioritizing education. We've, we've deprioritized it and made it unaccessible for so many people. And yeah, I think we that really it's have. a great counterpoint. It's, it's, well, actually, it's a huge issue. I would say um, that uh, right now people are kind of sitting up and realizing that there's very little um, women or um, people of color in the building industry. Mm -hmm. That's also tied to the fact that it is so expensive and that if you have less resources and less access to help, you're just going to kind of fall into the cracks of the system and you're not going to be able to invest your money and the help that you need to be able to become a licensed architect is so expensive in the States yeah. to really go through that path. Yeah. So it, it, if, I think if we want to talk about accessible education, it just comes first and foremost from just somehow making it more affordable for everyone, no matter the background. Mm -hmm. And I think that we'll see more people in, in the field. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and so you are known as the seaweed girl. So tell us about that. So how did, how did that come about? Um, I was doing a little, uh, it was a charrette they're called. It's like a competition, but for the whole school. So everyone kind of gets together, everyone mixes from the different classes and we put together a little competition proposal. And I was trying to come up with a concept for it. And I, I was looking at, uh, I stumbled across this project called the Modern Seaweed House by Van Kunsten. And it was, a, it was a, a, a house that was built with this material called eelgrass uh, and it was called seaweed. And so I was like, building with seaweed? You can build with seaweed? What? <laughs> um, so I, I tried to find all the information I, I could, and I found out that it was actually an ode to a traditional uh, way of building on this island called Lesu. And I was looking at the construction of these houses, and they have these roofs that are so dramatic. They're like, they're a meter thick. Mm -hmm. And so you just have these massive dramatic farmhouses and I was just obsessed. I, I could not wrap my brain about it. How, how do you build with this material? Um, 
so I, I did the competition. We, we were finalists and so we didn't win, but I just thought it was such an interesting idea. And I wanted to figure out how you could take the thatching and prefabricate it because the project by Van Kunsten, they put the eelgrass in the walls as insulation, mm -hmm. but they also made these little cute little pillows out of the eelgrass and that was their facade element. But I was like, what, what about a contemporary version of thatch? What if, what would thatching with seaweed look like in 2020, for example? Well, and, and thatching um, has been done since the beginning of time for, for yes. building material. Uh, Absolutely. But, but with, with the seaweed and uh, eelgrass specifically, uh, how, how did that, how did that, you, you saw the picture and that was kind of the catalyst? Yeah, the picture was the catalyst. I just, well, also everything was in Danish. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I just, for the life of me, I just wanted to figure out how on earth do you build with this? Mm -hmm. So I, it took me like a year of really working on my Danish. And then I just went deep into it mm -hmm. and calling people who actually had worked on the project, who were connected to Lesu and asking, you know, how, how do you, how do you fetch with seaweed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it turns out that this was actually, um, something that was built on Lesu for over 800 years. Um, and it was because during the Middle Ages, it was a salt work industry. So they uprooted their like entire forest on the island to burn it for salt making. And they realized, oh no, we need a roofing material. Um, our animals eat our hay. We, we don't have enough hay to, to thatch roofs out of. This stuff's washing up and it's washing up a lot. Mm -hmm. Hey, we could we could use this. Mm -hmm. So the earliest forms of these houses, they had just like large clumps of the eelgrass and then they had the half timber framed construction. They had like a gigantic nail or a pin in it. And so that kind of just like spiked through the seaweed and held it in place. Mm -hmm. And of course it would slide down over time. They would just throw more on top and <laughs> kind of stomp on it and call it a day. <laughs> Um, but around, I think, uh, I guess around the 1700s or 1600s, um, the men started going to the sea for work. They were seafarers. They were they were uh, seamen. So um, the women were at home and they needed to to fix their roofs. So they looked at the eelgrass and a lot of them worked with spinning wool. So they created this technique for working with the eelgrass, like spinning wool. So they would twist it into these gigantic ropes, like massive, thick, thick ropes. And they would wind it around the rafters. And then that was the foundation that then the new seaweed would then pile on top of. Hmm. They would even dance on the roof to help compress it together. Mm -hmm. I um, saw that on your website, that the girls would dance on the roof. I thought that was so yeah. cool. Yeah. So, so I, I wanted to, uh, I would pay money to see a demonstration of that yeah. at, at one of your uh, exhibitions. Well, you can actually go to Lesu. There is a traditional uh, thatcher called Henning Johansson, and he repairs, he's in the process of repairing a lot of the roofs on the island. Uh -huh. um, nowadays, they use a power drill <laughs> to twist the gigantic uh, ropes. So they try to mechanize it and stuff. And I remember reading a quote that said it takes him like a month to build a roof because he doesn't have a whole village of 30 women ah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. that can help him put it together. Well, and you had brought something up in, in our previous conversation talking about craftsmanship and how in a lot of ways we've lost that, that spirit of craftsmanship. And I think that, that some of the work that you're doing points to the idea that it can make sense to bring some of that back for the reason that if we're looking at, at the total life of the building, it really can make a lot of sense to put some of that, that extra effort, that extra craftsmanship into it. What, what are your thoughts about craftsmanship and, and maybe where it's gone? So my thoughts are that people, so craftsmanship used to be, labor used to be cheap, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, all your friends come together, you help build a house, you know, if you've ever seen uh, Little House on the Prairie, Pa and all his friends are putting together the, the log cabin. Um, so labor, you know, used to not be a big deal. Nowadays, especially in Denmark, labor, especially craftsman labor is very, very expensive. So people are a little bit afraid to invest in, in craftsmanship because of, they're assuming that it's going to cost a lot of money and it can, but I also think that we can integrate it in ways that it doesn't have to necessarily. And I also think that, like you said, it's an investment of you're, you're hiring somebody who has all of this material knowledge. So they have the ability to build more sustainably in many cases because they have that skill. Uh, where you can build without using glue and wood just by using clever joinery. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, in Japan, they still 
build with this joinery technique, but what they've done is they've incorporated CNC milling into it so that every single joint is calculated ahead of time. It's just CNC milled perfectly. It gets to site. They just hammer it into place and you have your structure. That's really um, so there's ways that we can optimize technology with craftsmanship, I think, and craftsman knowledge so that it doesn't have to cost <laughs> a ton of money. Um, and I would like to see us move a little bit more in this direction too. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that that coupling of new technology with old methods, it can make a lot of sense um, in, in the thatching for, for the roof material. I, I think that one of the, the challenges that we, we run into is that in Seattle specifically, it, we've set the standard of building enclosure science so high that it can make it difficult to integrate older technologies because uh, there's not necessarily science on it. Uh, so what, what was yeah. your experience in working with eelgrass in that context? This is, this is actually completely my experience. It's so hard to find numbers, so hard to find uh, qu uh, quantitative data on, on all of it. And, and people will say stuff like, this is why I actually created my newer project, because people were saying, hey, it's a fantastic sound editor in the 1900s. And now, you know, there's some projects that are beginning to experiment with um, the acoustic properties of it. And so I have numbers for, you know, current products that are, are, are making it with eelgrass. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any numbers for like just regular raw eelgrass. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the acoustic property of that? I just can't find any numbers for the life of me. So it's really hard to find data. And then so it's very hard to then argue that these materials should be used in current buildings because there's just no data that shows that they're actually within the standards. And we might know that they're within standards because we built with them for so long and these older houses are like living proof of it. But because we just don't have the studies on it, mm -hmm. it then becomes very difficult to integrate it. And yeah. there's, there's a big challenge anytime when testing standards come into play. Because yeah. when you think about where testing standards come from, uh, mm -hmm. where, where the money for the testing comes from. It all comes from companies banking to make They're money to sell stuff. on yeah, technology. I have this product that sets the new standard. Whereas exactly. if, we're, if we're looking at, at old products, natural products, products that mm -hmm. could be more readily available and much less expensive, who's paying for mm -hmm. the testing on those? Where's the, where's the motivator? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I've found great success in using grants and grant funding to help test um, and their connection and also in relation to academia. So um, I think these private grant foundations that are looking to help move things, they, they have been a really big motivator in Denmark and in Europe. Uh, sort of goodwill uh, testing to help move things forward. But we've had actually a discussion just yesterday um, in, at Dutch Design Week. There was a, a panel called Drive, and it was about bio-based design, and I was there as one of the few guests. And we had a discussion that actually there might be a need for more regulation, mm -hmm. uh, because if you put more regulation in and say you have to build more sustainably, then people will want to invest money into it uh, because there there is no other way to build and that will drive innovation forward because people will be forced to innovate to adhere to the newer standards and I know in the US we're like oh no hate regulation yeah. worst thing in the world there's nothing worse than applying for a building permit and getting a big fat red no because you're not compliant on something mm -hmm. but in certain cases I think it can make sense to just push it forward because it's somewhere, I think in the States personally, we've been lagging behind. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've, been, we've been the forerunners in so many things, but I think in this particular area, we've been really hurting. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do better. I know we can do better, so. Well, so I, I shared a story with you previously about natural materials on a job that I was working on. And we had this contaminated site. We were working on this cleanup in, in downtown Seattle where we had dumped creosote. It was a, a log treating facility. Say we, but we, you guys did not. No, we didn't do it. This was, this this was done over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And they would take the logs off of the ships, put them on docks and treat it with creosote. And, and this is like tar and it would just sink to the bottom of the water. Well, they, they covered it all up with soil so they could build on it. And then yeah. what, a hundred years later we're there and we're having to excavate through this material and it's it's full of oil 
And so it was literally like scooping soup up a hill. It, it just was not working. And uh, the, the excavator, it was uh, uh, Clear Creek contractors, uh, they had an idea, did some research and found this material. It was called diatomaceous earth. Is that it? They were diatoms. Yeah, so yeah. They were these little, little microorganisms that, that show up in under the soil like deposits, and uh, they work like kitty litter. So you go and you excavate truckloads and truckloads of this stuff, put it into the hole, and mix that material up. And that's a natural material. It's a naturally occurring material. We could have went and fabricated some sort of like plastic, uh, even more toxic than, than the creosote, and added that to the mix to get it out. Uh, now we have this this unnatural product that we pulled out, right? We could have plasticized it or something along those lines. Um, yeah. But by looking at what was available in the natural world, it actually made more sense to, to be able to come up with a good solution. And I think that there are a lot of cases where we just don't consider some of those natural options as being at the table. They're, they're typically yeah. not. So uh, let's let's go ahead and, and take a look at the, the, some of the samples that you have for us for what you've been working on. Uh, yes. <laughs> let's share your share your news. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so I am exhibiting at Dutch Design Week online due to COVID. All the design fairs have been moved online. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I have done is I've been working on uh, creating a thatched acoustic version of my original panel that's for more interior use. Mm -hmm. And I really do hope to be able to test this just for acoustic properties at some point. It was supposed to be tested in Denmark before I left Denmark, but because of COVID, it got canceled many times. So it would just be super great to see if we have some numbers just to prove how well does raw eelgrass acoustically insulate a space. How, that would be so cool. How is that attached to the back of the panel? Um, it's woven. It's thatched together. I have um, actually a video on YouTube now that shows how we built it. Oh, cool. And you can kind of see how I'm sort of using this mechanism to weave and twist. And um, and somebody said to me, you know, this this I can see this took you a long time. It wouldn't be smart to have it if you need to have it mass produced. And, you know, that's the brilliant thing is that I'm doing this for research purposes. But there's a product that's coming onto the market soon that's called Seawool. Seawool in Danish. Seawool. <laughs> and uh, what, yes. what is the, the O with the slash through it? What's the pronunciation of that letter? <laughs> <laughs> it took great. me two years to even begin to pronounce Danish. So the <laughs> fact that you thought I was Danish That's because great. of my video just like tickled my heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> I still can't say this right, by the way. I'm not saying it right at all. But these are uh, um, eelgrass that is shredded and compressed together with a binder. So it's really easy to make, really easy to cut. Mm -hmm. And eelgrass right now in Denmark is actually not used. It's seen as waste. So this is something that takes a waste resource and then turns it into a usable product. And I really love that. So yeah. if, of course, if it's an interior acoustic panel in, in that format, you have to worry a little bit less about infiltration, right? Water infiltration. Yeah. Uh, but how how do we interact with, with conversation about mold? And if, if we are using it as some sort of building material, uh, how does how does seagrass perform in, in that capacity? Because if it's a thatched roof, obviously it's been there forever. Uh, yeah. It, it's been used for, for hundreds of years. What we have all of these these preconceived notions about things, concerns like mold. What, yeah. what uh, is your response to that? So that's actually the really interesting thing uh, that I've been looking at more closely over the last year is that with natural materials like these materials, they're porous. Mm -hmm. So air can you know go through and also ventilate these constructions and create what's known as a breathable construction. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the way we, we work with materials, we want to have a breathable construction to a, a certain point, and then we want to kind of stop it from letting moisture in and ruining our walls. So we put all these membranes in to sort of stop that from happening because we have synthetic materials where if the moisture gets trapped, it's just going to wreck our walls. Mm -hmm. But with natural materials for insulation or for cladding, that moisture can sort of permeate and diffuse through the construction. So it also allows air to pass through, but always also moisture. So you don't have to worry about mold. So in, in Denmark and in the Netherlands, I have obviously traditional standard construction. I need to open my windows 
to let the air circulate so that I don't get black mold around my window frame. And, and that's just a sign of moisture getting into the construction. And that's because we're building now so thick. My walls are like this thick mm -hmm. because we're trying to make walls thicker so that less heat escapes. So it's more sustainable. But when we're using these synthetic materials, then we're running into this catch 22 of now the construction's so airtight that there is, if moisture gets in and starts to grow, it can be a real problem. So um, places in Denmark are trying to look more about how can we create breathable construction with natural materials and how does this affect the indoor, indoor air quality and how does this affect people who are in the space? Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of projects. One I can think of is called, uh, I guess, the breathable house, it would be translated as. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly what they're looking at. Um, what, what is the, the pronunciation in Danish? Uh, did did own bar did own <laughs> I don't even know if I'm even saying that right. So if anyone who's Danish is watching, I'm sorry that I'm butchering your language right now. You know, I'll just believe yes. you. It, it sounds perfect. It sounds perfect. Uh, but they are using thatch too in that building, and they're also using, I think, hemp insulation. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and so, so really cool. part of what you were you were hinting at there is that when you're using natural materials with with uh, manufactured materials, then they don't necessarily play well together. Uh, because Not necessarily. It depends. Mm -hmm. So it depends. Um, I think if you really want to have that breathable quality, you need to kind of go all natural. Um, kind of full system, right? Full system. Yeah. But I think there's a potential that you can mix different systems together in a hybrid system, especially if you're renovating. Yeah. So if you have an existing structure that's concrete or steel, you might then be able to then build on top of that a breathable envelope mm -hmm. out of natural materials. Yeah. Um, so so. In, in Seattle, there was a project that, that a company that I was working for did several years ago called the Bullet Foundation or the Bullet Center. Bullet Center. And it was the first living building that was constructed for commercial use, uh, where they they create uh, as much energy as they consume, but by and large, they they created their own energy. Uh, they, they have neat stuff like where every time you open a door, it like uses the turn of the door handle to gather the, that energy. Everything in the in the building is basically generating energy. They're handling their own uh, wastewater. They're they're generating their own water from from storm processing uh, so it, it was really kind of an interesting project and it was an investment from the standpoint that they're trying to do something that's never been done before on a scale that's never been done before and I think that that when they when you take the approach or if you take the approach we need to, to get our heads around the whole science here we need to get our heads around this whole system and what it looks like then in, in the case of the Bullet Center, what you saw is that there were several others that came after it. And every iteration, we're learning more and more about the science of how this stuff works together. And I, I know that you're, you're a, a grant holder, you've, you've received money to, to continue research, and I, I want to hear about that. But what thoughts do you have about a whole building, a whole uh, project initiative where, where the big goal is constructing that whole breathable uh, assembly all together and monitoring that over time. Yeah, I think that that's really necessary. That's where we desperately need research. And like you said, we need funding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's just no way around it. And when we were at the conference yesterday, that was the theme throughout of all of it, is we need to show that this is viable because it's just not even being shown. Mm -hmm. And we also need to integrate regular people into the conversation too and let them know about this because people also too, I mean, when I'm working with eelgrass, for instance, people are like, ew, isn't it smell? Isn't it going to rot? Isn't it slimy? That stuff stinks. I know it from the beach. Yeah. So, so people's first instinct isn't, wow, what a great innovative idea. They're like, uh, I don't know. Are you sure? I don't want that near my house. Uh -huh. So we have to have conversations with regular people about you know, these old materials. And I think one of the great ways to do it is by looking at history and looking at the local architecture in areas and using that as a catalyst to talk about natural materials. Mm -hmm.
Well, I, I, well, I think something interesting though is you think about the Bullet Center, and that's just a that's just an office building, right? Mm -hmm. There's just offices in there, um, and I think it would be really interesting if you could put something together where instead of saying, "Hey, university, let's build this," you know, really natural mm -hmm. building so we can study it. If instead you said, if you could convince someone who you know now more and more what Amazon building has the giant glass. Spheres. Spheres. Called Bezos's balls. <laughs> and, it's what and it's they, locally yeah. referred to. As, you know, yeah. there's, this, there's this drive that is, if I want to have this business, I want to differentiate myself and do mm -hmm. something cool. And they're doing lots of cool stuff with plants inside mm -hmm. the spheres. Mm -hmm. So the idea that if you could convince some company that has the money anyway, and you could convince them, let's build this all natural building for your headquarters, then basically you kind of get some of that funding mm -hmm. to get the thing built, get to be able to study it. Uh, and, and actually get the thing stood up. Yeah, who are the major players that would want to project that they build natural? To be able to say, we built the first all-natural office building in the United States, right? Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that's already sort of, sort of starting to happen in Europe, is we're investigating a lot with wood construction. Mm -hmm. So the first wood skyscraper is a thing that people are really excited about. Mm -hmm. They want to see, you know, wood sized skyscrapers, you know, okay, how are we doing this? How are we doing that? Mm -hmm. So that the energy is here, mm -hmm. but it needs to be everywhere, mm -hmm. I think, um, because there's just so much room for it. And there's room for experimentation and for cool stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that I run into too, is that people like immediately are like, I have a vision of a mud hut. Are you going to build this for me? This like mud hut. And I'm like, first off, don't hate. Mud huts are awesome. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, like it, it doesn't have to be Paul's log cabin. We can, we can upgrade Pa a little bit, you know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we can make it interesting from an, a design perspective. We can be creative with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I really want to show that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so what does what does sustainability look like for the products that you're you're looking to use? I mean, obviously, it seems like you just could pull it out of the water, uh, do whatever preparation you need to, put it into service. And then when you're done with it, it can just go back into the water. When is that, <laughs> yeah. That about the well, you wouldn't want to put it back into the water, but you could use it to grow potatoes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Fun fact. <laughs> um, but that's, I, a, that's a different Catherine Larson project. <laughs> yes, yeah. actually. Seaweed fertilizer <laughs> on the market soon. No, they actually do. They do. The, the farmers that I get my eelgrass from, they're like, we have all this research that shows it's awesome for potatoes mm -hmm. or for, for ground uh, ground cover. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there, I mean, there's a lot of options there too. Yeah. But um, yeah, I uh, know uh, you could definitely create this new system and this new cycle with the material. And yes, you do fish it out of the water, mm -hmm. clean it off, and then put it into a wall cavity. Right. <laughs> That's all you need cool. to do. <laughs> but so mm -hmm. I, a question that I, I got over the course of uh, the lead up to this conversation is what about fire? Ah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Because so I think what's, if you're if you're spread out in in uh, Denmark, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm showing my American. Well, I'm right now. I'm in the Netherlands, actually. Okay. I, but I worked. In, <laughs> it's almost the same country. Oh, so Everyone close. seems to think, you know, Denmark, Dutch, Danish. Oh. You know, what's the difference? Oh. They both like. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, fire concern. So obviously, if if you're in an environment where the houses are spaced it's further rural. apart, uh, yeah. fire spreading is is a lesser concern. So, so talk to me about fire concern. In in I, I yeah, I would say fire is probably the number one concern when we're building always mm -hmm. uh, because you know you have to make sure it's safe for people to egress and that rooms are not going to burn down like super quickly that you have zones and stuff. Right. Um, eelgrass by itself is naturally fire resistant. Mm -hmm. It will catch fire, but then it will just kind of smolder for a while. I found some really interesting tests that were done on TV in Denmark where they had these constructions with eelgrass kind of put into it and they set it on fire to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, with things like this where it's shredded and then compressed, mm -hmm. it's even more fire resistant. Um, I'm pretty sure 
There is a product that's similar to this that was called um, Lesus Ostera. It was, a, it was an insulation bat that goes in the wall. Mm -hmm. And that was actually fire rated for the class um, in Denmark. So it was, it was compliant with fire standards. Um, and that's just because the eelgrass itself has salt in it. Mm -hmm. And the salt is what acts as the fire resistant mechanism. Wow. But people are also very concerned about thatch roofs. So in Denmark, if you have a thatch roof, the insurance for it is sky high because mm -hmm. their assumption is that this thing is going to catch on fire mm -hmm. and ignite. Um, but what's interesting is that hay by itself in a construction isn't necessarily super, super flammable, um, especially if it's oxygen deprived mm -hmm. in a construction in your wall mm -hmm. and densely packed together. It's, sure. it's actually pretty uh, fire resistant in that sort of construction. Wow. So it's gonna take studying and also confronting our prejudices with these materials mm -hmm. for us to be able to develop it further, I think. Well, and one of the, the conversations that Mary and I have had over years is the, the impact to our society that say the 1950s had on, on yeah. US and world culture. Mm -hmm. Asbestos. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but specifically what we're talking about is kind of the plasticization mm -hmm. of everything. Uh, it looks like you have some strobes going on. <laughs> that would be my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, you live in a discotheque? <laughs> He, he wants me to feel like I'm in a party mood. There you go. <laughs> He's coming to investigate. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's a, there was the era in American history where we, we had Tupperware parties, right? We oh. uh, turned everything. We still have Tupperware parties. I don't know where you are in the States <laughs> or where right, I'm right. from. You have Tupperware parties? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's Nowadays, awesome. they're called MLM schemes. You got to get with the program. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but but essentially everything was was turned into kind of shiny, uh, false. Everything became manufactured and it high, was all high gloss uh, paint, kind of commercialized. Right, everything was manufactured, and that was what was seen as as good enough. Uh, this is the keeping up with the Joneses kind of sentiment, and I yeah. think that one of the the negative things that came out of that is that we moved away from a lot of natural materials. We moved away from. Yeah. Uh, natural mm -hmm. haircuts or, you know, what have you. And I think that, that uh, we, we kind of cleansed the U.S. culture and yeah. went with this highly manufactured line of products. Mm -hmm. I think what it was is we put a lot of faith in this new um, manufacturing and this new aesthetic that, that came out of it. It was a total aesthetic. Yeah. And it was an aesthetic, too, that was promoted by architects and by designers and interior designers. Mm -hmm. And, and to some extent, we, we really didn't know better, honestly. We, you know, we thought that this was a, asbestos is a really great insulator. Yeah. We didn't know at the time just how harmful it is. Mm -hmm. But that's what I find is so interesting about these older materials is we have all these thousands of years knowing that, hey, they're pretty good. Yeah. They're pretty decent. Yeah. We knew this before we even knew this kind of. Mm -hmm. And somehow we knew this around the entire world. But we have more of a distrust now in these sorts of materials because now we're so accustomed to these newer, more manufactured materials. And, and it's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Mm -hmm. it, these materials are super high performance, super, you know, in some cases, very cheap, very easy to get a hold of, very easy to use. Mm -hmm. And they're designed very, very well. So how are you going to make natural materials compete with that? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you can be very clever and apply new engineering, new sort of focal points at it and you can sort of rethink it. Um, just to give an example, yesterday I met two, two entrepreneurs, two women who are working with the dredge from rivers here. So when the river, river is dredged, you have all this like kind of gross soil um, that nobody's using. They don't want, it's, it's poor nutrients. It's just kind of going to be wasted. And they take it and they compress it down into a brick under high pressure. So no heat is used, but it's basically this brick that's made out of this waste earth. Um, and what's really interesting is that this is basically a form of stamped earth or, you know, <laughs> rammed earth. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's in a compressed brick that you can then build an interior wall with. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I think the brilliant thing is, is that this type of construction that might be very labor intensive is suddenly reduced down into a very smart, very eco-friendly product. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I think I take a lot of inspiration from that actually. Yeah. So I have to ask Catherine, what does the, the seagrass panel smell like? Kind of smells like, uh, like hay. 
a little bit of salty, salty hay. Okay. Uh, people, people are definitely uh, surprised when they smell it because uh, I think they're expecting something that's very stinky, um, and it's it's almost sweet smelling. So that's a, that's a kind of a shocker to most people. Hmm. Uh, so you're always very busy. You're you're on the move and and doing lots of interesting things. So tell me about Dutch Design Week. What is that? Uh, yeah, Dutch Design Week is the bomb. It's like the design week. <laughs> it's 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 the big design week of, of the, the Netherlands. And uh, there's a couple of very good design schools here. Mm -hmm. And there's also just a really thrumming underground design scene. And the Dutch design week gives everyone a platform to be able to come and present their work and to kind of showcase it. Mm -hmm. um, last year, I was uh, a part of Dutch design week for this uh, conference that was called Antenna, where they give a platform to, uh, they call it the... Uh, the best graduates of best new graduates of the world or the best new design graduates in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and they have, they, they select people personally and they ask them to audition with a video mm -hmm. about their project and their thesis project. And then they select 10 to 20 students from those videos. Um, and so out of 300, I was one of 20 that was selected to then share my work at this conference. That's great. Congratulations. It was really, really awesome. cool yeah. and a really fantastic experience. And they also try to connect you. So there's different pavilions and embassies, world design embassies that are at uh, Dutch Design Week. And so they have different themes. So what they try to do is they try to connect different designers that work in similar themes mm -hmm. together. Um, so my work has often been connected to the embassy of bio-based design and the embassy of bio-based, bio-based basically just means natural materials, materials from the earth. Mm -hmm. So, um, so my work is usually there. And then it's usually also people that work with, um, materials that are waste. Mm -hmm. So natural materials that are sort of like the husks from rice. Mm -hmm. What do you do with those? Right. Well, you can make a really good board out of it <laughs> that you can then build with. <laughs> so, huh. so there's all these sorts of really cool innovations and they build with them and they showcase them and, um, connect different people that are, working with the same sort of thing. And so it's just, it's a lot of energy and a lot of cool cutting edge stuff and a really great atmosphere to be a part of. So where can we expect to see you next? Where are you headed? What are you, what are you going to do with your career? Oh, I, I, you can't ask me that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, my goal is eventually to start my own firm in Denmark. Um, I would love to start a firm that focuses a lot on um, renovating, but also on these uh, research projects and this exploration into traditional and sustainable materials and then hopefully applying that on larger scale projects. Mm -hmm. So that is my, that's my dream. <laughs> All right. Well, did we do it? I think so. I think we're doing good. All right. Well, it's been great having you on, Catherine. Uh, we're really excited to, to hear what comes next and, and what you're up to in the future. Uh, feel free to, to keep us updated. We'd love to talk to you again. Thank you. All right. Well, okay. well. so you can find more about Catherine and what she's doing. Where's your website, Catherine? It's www.catherinelarson.com. Yeah. It's easy, and That's you'll find it in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in, in what it is that we do, we're running our Foreman Basic Training Program, and we have two spaces left for our January session. So go ahead and check that out at arcadewayfinding.com. You can find us in West Seattle Island yep. for the next three years until they fix the bridge. Until they fix the bridge. Yeah. You can find drive us. Drive all the way around and come have a cup of coffee with us. That's right. You can find us on the criticalpathpodcast.com. Mm -hmm. uh, also available there. LinkedIn. Uh, a little bit on Twitter. Yep. Uh, we're at uh, arcadewayfinding.com forward slash YouTube where mm -hmm. you'll be able to find this video after the fact. Yep. And for the podcast nerds, go ahead and check out the podcast episode a couple of days after today. Yep, the we'll audio have only. Some, we'll have some great outtakes for what happens after we shut off the cameras here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Watch for it. Watch for it. <laughs>